Megan Good is a 31-year-old from Ohio. If you've never heard of her, don't worry. She's not a missing person. Actually, her work forms one of the cornerstones of the entire true crime podcasting community. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. First, to Anthony in Australia, he was a listener of the show I used to do, and now he is a loyal listener to this new one, and I would like to thank him for suggesting a case that I'm working on right now, one that I hadn't heard about, but one that I'm going to keep digging on and trying to find somebody to appear on this show so that all of you can find out about it. And I also need to give a shout-out to a guy who has become a friend of mine, another listener, Jeremiah in Michigan. I need to thank him for starting the Unfound Discussion page on Facebook. I'd love to see all of you there. You can talk to me one-on-one. You can talk about the cases. You can talk to other listeners, sometimes about what I'm covering on this show. Maybe we can even have some discussions on cases that are being covered elsewhere or cases you'd like for me to concentrate on in the future. If you're on Twitter, I can be found at Unfound Podcast. If you already do follow me, you know that every day I tweet out the links and pictures to people who have disappeared on a particular day of the week. So for October 20th, I would tweet out everybody who's disappeared on October 20th going back several decades. I do that every day. So you can check that out, and then I would urge you to subscribe to the show on iTunes. Uh, That would greatly help the show out. Getting to this particular show, you probably already realize that I do things a little bit differently. My shows, frankly, tend to run a little long. Uh, Interviews that go an hour and a half. I love to work with themes, probably because I'm a little bit artsy-fartsy. My show just tends to have a little bit of a different tone compared to others out there. Not necessarily on purpose, just kind of the person that I am. And today's show is a further expression of that. You're not going to get a case today. I'm just going to be honest with you. Because once in a while, I'm going to have somebody on the show who I believe is behind the scenes doesn't have a show, does not have himself or herself out there doing interviews, but who I discover is doing something very important within the missing persons community. Maybe a good example of this would be Kelly Murphy, who I interviewed in one of my first shows. Yes, we talked about the disappearance of her son Jason, but I also devoted a whole entire show to her work, her nonprofit organization, and what she does there. I think that's important. That's what's going on with today's show. And there's some reasons for that. As I keep telling you, I'm just a reporter. I go out there, find people who have the information. I interview them. You get to listen to them. You get to hear them speak instead of listening to me tell their story. Because there are people out there who you don't know their names who are doing work that without their work, a lot of the shows that you enjoy that you find on Podomatic or iTunes, simply the shows wouldn't exist, to put it frankly. In fact, you could even say in so many words that maybe not even this show would exist. These are people who make our jobs as podcasters easy at least easier. So these people deserve to be recognized, and I want to make sure that on this show uh, I note who these people are so you know who these people are. 
So who is Megan Good? She happens to be the owner, administrator, and writer at charlieproject.org. I have to tell you, the way that uh, she and I met was, I, as I've told you, I want to cover people who are doing these things, what I would call behind the scenes. And I thought, well, it would be a good idea to contact the people, plural, who run charlieproject.org because that is a site that I go to often. In fact, you know I give that website credit in my cases when I read the facts, just saying that I'm using a condensed version that you could find at some place like charlieproject.org. You've heard me say that. So I contacted the site, emailed them, and this young woman, Megan, gets back to me. And I'm thinking, oh, she's one of maybe several people who compile these lists, this database, and write these, uh, all this information and facts and edit each case. Nope. Megan Good runs that entire site. All 9,500 cases by herself. By herself. And I can't even begin to tell you how I almost fainted when she told me that in our first conversation. Now, what was interesting about our first conversation is that I had made kind of a loose appointment to talk to her on a certain Friday, I'm going to say about a month ago. And I had gotten caught up talking to somebody else about a a case that I'm not sure I still have done. And she tried to call me, and I couldn't pick up because I was on the other line. And then that Friday night, I finally did uh, finish the other conversation. And I hadn't been off the phone for two minutes, but my phone rang again. And I could see it was the same number from, from before I picked it up. And here it was. It was Megan on the phone. And I apologized to her for not picking up the first time. And I told her I was on the phone with so-and-so. And before I could go even further, Megan says to me, Oh, I know her. She is the blank of this case. I, I, w- I was like, you know that? Yeah, I know that. So she is an encyclopedia. Megan Good is an encyclopedia of missing persons cases. And I can tell you that I have been fascinated by her and the work that she's done since that first time that I talked to her. And I think we've become friends since. And I thought all of you should get to know her and her work as well as I've gotten to know her because I have deep respect for what she does. And I think that you'll understand a little bit more about why I'm saying this once you hear the interview. So without further ado, I give you Megan Good of charlieproject.org. I am so happy to have on the phone uh, a young woman who I believe really forms, at least her website, which she does, forms one of the strong base components of the true crime genre, the interest in it, disappearances, missing persons, all of that in the United States. I have on the phone Megan Good from the Charlie Project. Megan, thank you so much uh, for joining me on Unfound. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm I'm very well. I'm honored to be here. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Tell the listeners a little bit about you and just about what makes Megan Good Megan Good. Your maybe a little bit of your upbringing and what has brought you to this point in your life, and then we'll get into the Charlie Project. Well, I grew up in a teeny tiny farm community way out in the middle of nowhere with less than 200 people in it. I have six older siblings, and when I was at home, I growing up, I didn't have a whole lot of guidance or, or attention. Mm-hmm. And so I spent a lot of my time reading, and I became fascinated with people's stories. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to, to learn everything about the lives of other people, especially people that had been kind of forgotten about. And 
Okay. So famous people, so famous people yeah. or people who have dis so famous people. Okay. Right. Yeah, famous people and people who probably should have been famous except, you know, they got they got forgotten about. They slipped mm -hmm. into the void of history. Yeah. I studied history in in college. Mm -hmm. And it was it was all about trying to trying to learn as many stories as I could and then share them with others. Any particular stories that back then really caught your attention that you thought the listen you think the listeners should know about? Maybe they'll look into it for themselves. Well, people a lot of them ask me why did I name it the Charlie Project? Mm -hmm. And this is because back in the eighteen seventies there was a little four year old boy named Charlie Ross who was kidnapped for ransom in Pennsylvania. And his father, Christian Ross, refused to pay the ransom. And this was not because he didn't want his child back. He adored Charlie and wanted to spend the rest of his life looking for him. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, ransom kidnapping at the time did not happen. In fact, kidnapping itself was not a criminal offense in the state of Pennsylvania simply because it did not happen. I did and, not know that. That's interesting. And I'm yeah. from Pennsylvania. I didn't know that. Yeah, when... Charlie was kidnapped, the police said that the best they could do as far as prosecuting the people who took him would be to prosecute them for stealing his clothes. They said uh, individually each I, each garment uh, would be up to seven years in prison, and so it could be effectively a life sentence that they were able to catch these people. Mm -hmm. And so Christian Ross spent a considerable time negotiating with the kidnappers. His idea was that they would probably just give his kid back once they realized they weren't going to get any money and that didn't happen mm -hmm. and then he had this this other notion that it would be morally wrong to pay the ransom for charlie because this was a test case this had never happened before and it would be setting a bad precedent other people would get the idea and start catching kids left and right mm -hmm. and so he had to be the one to stand up and say i'm not going to do this and everything totally backfired on him. He never saw his son again, ever. And he spent the rest of his life looking for this little boy. Wow. And other people did get the idea to start snatching kids left and right and ransom. So mapping became a popular thing. And they would leave notes saying, you know, just in case you're thinking of not paying, remember what happened to Charlie Ross. Yeah. And the thing is, this was incredibly famous at the time. You know, mm. even decades after the fact, people around the world, Norwegian mm. tourists, at one point they went to Pennsylvania and they're like, yeah, we'd like to stop by Charlie Ross's old house. And if we have time, we'll go see the Liberty Bell, too. Wow. And really? I, now, I, I, no I had no idea all about this. And like I said, I spent 28 years of my life in Pennsylvania. That's yeah. fascinating. No one remembers him today. And I happened to come across this story when I was uh, – 14 or 15 years old, and I was just sucked in by it and uh -huh. never forgot it. And then later on, I decided to name my website after him because somebody should know this child's name. Yeah. Somebody should know what happened to him. And this happened in the 1870s? Is that right? 18... Yeah. And where in Pennsylvania? In, the Western, Eastern Pennsylvania? Where, where it, was in, it was in the outskirts of Philadelphia. Okay. You know, Philadelphia wasn't a major, huge working city at the time, and, and mm -hmm. Christian Ross was actually a farmer. Mm -hmm. What do you suspect happened? happened? What do you suspect happened with uh, Charlie Ross? Do you think that the kid grew up, or do you think that he was murdered? What What did your research tell you? Well, the thing is, the, they actually were able to identify the kidnappers pretty quickly. It was just a matter of tracking them down. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Charlie's older brother, Walter, who was eight, was also taken, and the, the kidnappers offered to give them a ride in their wagon and take them to the candy store. Mm -hmm. And so they, they took the boys, and, you know, they rode around for a long time, and then they stopped at the candy store, and they gave Walter some money and said, go inside and get some candy for yourself and your brother. And Walter came out, and his brother and the wagon and the two men were gone. And the thing is, what strikes me is that Walter got a good look at them and was, in fact, able to identify them later. And the smart thing to do would have been to, like, knock him over the head somewhere and dump his body in a ditch. And yeah. they didn't do that. 
and these these particular men do not strike me as being especially ruthless. They were a couple of rather mediocre uh, thieves who were finally caught when they got shot to death by the owner of a house they were brutalizing. Huh. One of them lived long enough to confess that he had been involved in the kidnapping, and he's like, I don't know where Charlie is. You'll have to ask my partner that, but his partner was dead. Wow. So I I can't say what happened. It's entirely possible that Charlie grew up, you know, under some other name, not knowing who he was. Yeah. And it's entirely possible that he was killed or that he perhaps was in some hiding place and wound up starving to death because there was no one to come and feed him after that. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, I think the whole story, though, was incredible. And you have to think about his father, you know, the way he right. was thinking. Right. And the moral ambiguity there. Is that what's going through your mind every time you put one of these new entries on your site at Charlie Park? Does, does that always come back to you when you when you do these entries on your on your website? Well... I don't think about Charlie every day, mm-hmm. but when I when I am trying to put together a case file for a missing person, what I'm most concerned about is telling the story as to what happened to them and who they were. Yeah. And I've got so many cases that, in my mind, they are the most depressing ones that just say, you know, they were last seen at this place on this date and yeah. details are available. And it's really sad because these people, you know, they existed and they, they have a story behind them. And I don't know what it is, and many times I never find out. Right, right. And I, and as a guy who goes to your website quite often, I know the exact, you know, those kinds of stories that you're talking about. It's just like a yeah. couple sentences, and no other information is available. There's a, there's too many of those, isn't there? Oh yes. And when I find out a lot of information about a case that I had had nothing on, that makes my day. Yeah. Right. And I uh, I recently uh, wrote on my blog about a, a case I had had on my website for a long time that had no information. And then some people that like to send me information, I call them the Charlie Project Irregulars. They just have taken it upon themselves to do research for me and, mail, and email me articles and things. And mm-hmm. they looked up all sorts of information on this man, and they found out he had actually led a fascinating life. He'd come from from Yugoslavia to America during the Cold War, and he had apparently been a very intelligence-driven person who got a uh, business degree from one of the most uh, prestigious business schools in the entire country. And, it, you know, I learned about his, his two marriages and his children, and he was involved in setting up some kind of factory in Mexico, one of the first ones, the Maquiladoras, that make goods for export to the U.S., What's his name? So, what's his name? So the listeners can go check that out on your site. What's this person's name? Mirko Yug. You better spell that last name for everybody. Y U G. Y U G. All right, his last name is Yug. Just yeah. go there. Go. I know into the alphabetical index that you have there, people could go there and find him. Great. That that's and, great. And it's just. It was just really fascinating reading all about him, and I have no idea whether any of this has anything to do with his disappearance. I still can't find any details about that, but it was just thrilling for me to write up this man's life story. Now, maybe people don't know this, and I'm going to, you know, if everybody wants to know how Megan and I even got in contact with each other, is that I am uh, set on introducing to my listeners some of those people behind the scenes that I don't think get enough credit within the true crime genre. And of course, The Charlie Project is a well-known site, and I have to admit that when I first got in contact with The Charlie Project site, I thought it was run by a multitude of people, and and I think I told Megan this the first time we talked. The truth is, you run that site all by yourself, for the most part. That's right. That is amazing to me, Megan. I can't even begin to tell you how amazed I am by that. That well, sounds like a big job. Tell us tell us a little bit about that. I probably would not be able to do what I do if it weren't for the fact that I have a high functioning form of autism. Mm-hmm. And it autism is a pain in the neck, frankly. 
Yeah. And what I have is what a lot of people call Asperger's syndrome, although the the psychiatric community mm-hmm. has recently decided to just pull all the all the names for autism into just one general autism autistic spectrum disorder. Mm-hmm. And seventy five percent of adults with Asperger's syndrome are unemployed. They're we have a lot of issues that that cause, like especially social problems. Yeah. Getting along with other people. Mm-hmm. But one of the symptoms of Asperger's syndrome is having a really, really, really intense interest in something a, a very small, focused area. Yeah. Like uh, there was one man I can think of who was fascinated by uh, streetcars. He could tell you he had how to travel by streetcar from place to place in many cities he had never been to because he was studying their schedules all the time. Yeah. And for me, a lot of it is missing persons. And so, so many people, I think, who don't have my condition would be unable to keep this up for as long as I have because it is a lot of work and, you know, constantly, you know, going over articles and trying to track down information every single day, day in and day out. Mm -hmm. What I try to do with the Trolley Project, what no other missing persons database does, is I try to take all the information available about a person and their disappearance and write it all up in like an essay form so that if you want to learn about this case, rather than tracking down 20 different sources, you just go to my website and it's all there. Yes, you, you accumulate information, so it's a one-stop shopping type of thing. Yes, mm-hmm. and I don't actually try to solve the cases myself. I just, uh, mm-hmm. I just categorize them and catalog them, and other people can do the solving, and there have been people found as a direct result of what I have done. So let's get back to this. How long has the, has the Charlie Project been around, and do you remember... Did you, when you started it, you got involved in however it started. Did you know that you'd be doing it, you know, all these years later? Well, the Charlie Project just turned 12 years old. Happy birthday. This month. Yes. When I began the database in its current form, I was a 19-year-old college sophomore in Arkansas, you know, operating out of a dormitory room. I don't think it ever occurred to me to wonder how long I was going to keep this up. Mm-hmm. And it all really began back when I was 17, and I had come to know Jennifer Mara, who founded the Doe Network and the MPCCN, the Missing Persons Cold Case Network, both of which are mm-hmm. – that they, they were a lot like the Charlie Project is mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The Doe Network has uh, 15 people from all over the world as well as unidentified bodies. And so I started sending Jennifer this – information to put on her on her website when I was like 15, 16 and then when I was 17, Jennifer decided that she didn't want to do this anymore she had a couple of little kids and she was concerned about not spending enough time with them mm-hmm. and so she decided to give the website to me, the MPCCN and then uh, I ran it for about 11 months and then there was a very unfortunate incident where some some hackers for well they, they had a motive but it was a really really stupid petty personal one mm-hmm. that had nothing to do with me okay. uh, completely wrecked the database so the entire MPCC and I couldn't update it I couldn't do anything with it anymore and so I decided to you know, reconstruct it, and I spent an entire summer doing that, the summer between my freshman and sophomore years of college. And then in October of 2004, I, you know, put, put it up again, rebranded as the Charlie Project. Yeah. Right. It, right, and you've been working at it ever, and you've been working at it ever since. Uh, did you graduate college? Did you end up graduating? I, I don't know if I've ever asked you that. No, I actually wasn't able to graduate mm-hmm. college because basically throughout the entire time I was there, I was having a wonderful time, but I was also suffering from the undiagnosed autism, which wasn't diagnosed until I was 23, and 
Mm. It turned out I also had bipolar disorder. I've suffered from mental illness since I was a child, but I didn't get treatment until I was an adult. And I've got a kind of a nasty case mm. that is kept under control with medication, which works except when it doesn't. Yeah. And the thing is, the Trolley Project is actually a major part of my mental well-being. It kind of justifies my existence on this planet. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll tell myself, you know, nobody else can do this. And you know, when I have suicidal thoughts, I'll tell myself, you know, what if you killed yourself? What a logistical nightmare it's going to be if you, for everybody to figure out what to do with the Trolley Project now that I'm suddenly not there anymore. Megan, I, I totally agree with you. I, I think that you have found your place in this world. And, I mean, you are doing something that is so helpful to people. Obviously, you're doing something that's so helpful to those people like myself who do, you know, true crime podcasts and, you know, we go to your site and we go through your, you know, database looking for cases. I know I do that. I linked, I tweet about to, uh, links to the Charlie Project every day. It, it's interesting that you think about the, that, that, you know, you think that you've, this is what you were meant to do. Well, I think I've reached the point where I, I think I am going to have to take on some helpers to, you know, help write up the cases because the site has basically reached critical mass. It's got 9,500 cases on it right now, and I don't think I can make it any bigger by myself. Hmm. Well, it's gotten to the point where, like, my physical health is actually suffering as a result. Occasionally, I will go absolutely crazy and spend, like, 12 or 14-hour days on the computer updating the website, and then my back will go out. Wow. Well, you know, in studying for this interview, I'll have you know that I went to Alexa.com to check how popular the Charlie Project website is. It is very popular. It is – I mean, if I were to give out the number, and I don't want to do that, maybe people have heard the number. They wouldn't be that impressed. But being that I know – I did some checking on some other websites that I know about that are fairly popular, and yours is way more popular than most of them. It's a popular website. Well, I I know the number of users is you know it's been steadily increasing for a long time, yeah. and I want to keep that up. I just feel like now would be the best time to start bringing in other people because I mm -hmm. I can't do this by myself anymore, both physically and mentally. I've got my life is not the same as it was when I was nineteen, right. and the last time that I went on a really you know, on this binge of updates, I wound up having to get steroids injected into my back to ease the knotted up muscles I was in agony for a it couple of days. It becomes a little bit of an obsession for you, would you say? Is that? Oh, yes. Yes. And the thing is, many people have offered to help me with this over the years, and I've always turned them down, but I think probably within the next several months or, or so, I'm going to open up the gates and, and take on maybe slowly, you know, one or two people at first, and then we'll see where it goes. There's even a case I've actually kept back for years, a very high-profile case I haven't added to the site because hmm. I have this notion it could be like a job interview. I could tell them, you know, research and write up this case and try to make it sound like the other trolley project cases, and I'll do the same thing at the same time, and we'll see how we all do. So that's like a secret you have? that I suppose you can't tell me on this show. It's like a secret that you have? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Case. I love it. That's a great that's a that's a fascinating way to do an interview. That's a great idea, Megan. And I have no intention of, you know, stopping mm -hmm. myself anytime soon. I, I continue to I plan to continue to work on this website for as long as I can. I just think now is the time to add a couple of more people. I just want to be very careful about who I select because I want to keep the editorial standard high and everything. Yeah. I'm very proud of, you know, being able to, to come up with a lot of information and also the accuracy. You I should think, be. Um, it, uh, yeah. yeah, you do a great job. I mean, doing it by, like I told you, when I first contacted you, I thought, oh, there's probably four or five different people, you know, all over the United States or wherever doing this. And when I find out it's just you, I'm just so impressed. And that's why I said I have to interview this young woman. How does a case end up on the Charlie Project? What is the process? So, if, for example, if somebody goes dis disappears today, October 19th, 2016, 
what is the process for it then eventually to make it onto your site? Well, the person has to be missing for at least a year to make it onto the trolley project because I'm about the cold cases and also because I'm swamped as it is. Yeah. And uh, now there are a lot of databases out there of missing persons. NamUs is, of course, the biggest one, run by the federal government. Yeah. And it's got, oh, gosh, I don't even know how many cases it has on there now. Something like 15,000, I would guess. Okay. And I'm constantly surfing these databases and checking for names every day to mm. uh, for, for possible to add on to the website. And often it comes down to the sort of chance, like, you know, oh, I'll check out New Mexico today and see, see what they have to offer. Right. Yeah, there are yeah. several state databases. California's is very good. Mm -hmm. And some of the some of the state databases are somewhat less than impressive. Actually, you know, speaking of New Mexico, they have this really bad habit of failing to remove cases that have been solved. And once in a while, I have gotten extremely uh, embarrassed when I'll add a case, you know, only to discover the person turned up over a year ago. Mm -hmm. And this this happens sometimes with with my site, and I, and I am very embarrassed when it happens, I'm very apologetic, and I will remove any inaccurate or outdated information. But I'm also, I'm also thinking that these, these databases run by governments have, like, actual employees and actual, like, hard data that they're getting from police departments, and they're not doing as good a job as I am. Yeah, well, that... Well, that's that's no surprise, I guess. I mean, you're you know you're a private individual. You take ownership of your site personally. These other people, I'm not saying they're bad people, but it's just a job to them. You have the passion. They they're just it's just a nine to five job for them, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. And there is the issue of sometimes I get into conflicts with families of people on my website. Now, most of the time, we get along very well because. You know, I'll get a lot of emails from people saying, you know, uh, we thought that nobody even cared about her a anymore because she's been missing for so long. And mm -hmm. then we see that you, you bothered to take the time to write her up for your website. And just we're so happy that at least somebody remembers who she is. Yeah. And, you know, I got an email once from somebody talking about a little girl who had disappeared in the 19, I think the 1960s. And it just said that I'm her brother. Thanks. Wow. And so usually we get along very well, but sometimes there is a bit of a conflict because I am I will put up whatever I can find, and I'm not concerned about how it looks. Yeah. I want to call a spade a spade, and I'm not willing to tell lies, and I'm not willing to withhold the crucial information to the point where you might as well be telling lies. Good for you. Good for you. I mean, there was a case I had where there was a young woman who worked as an exotic dancer, and she was last seen at her place of employment, leaving with a strange man. And then that man was later identified and charged with her murder, although they never found the body. Mm -hmm. And her sister contacted me, absolutely furious, and said I was trying to make this young woman, you know, look trashy and so on, and was demanding that I remove the information about her being an exotic dancer and so on. And I'm like... Look, I'm very sorry, but I don't see how I can do that. She didn't disappear from the library. Yeah. She didn't disappear from home. She disappeared from work, leaving work with a customer who was later charged with her murder. This is all, like, super relevant. It's pertinent. It's important information. And I agree with you. Is, if someone is, for example, a uh, accountant and they disappear, the, they're probably going to be looking for them you know, in different places and among different people than they would if someone was a prostitute. That's right. And I, I understand the frustration there, and I try to be nice to everybody because I don't know what they're going through. I can't imagine what it's like mm -hmm. to have a family member go missing and, and never be found like that, but... There are certain things I'm just not willing to do, and then they get upset. This, the woman I was talking about, the exotic dancer, her sister was very angry with me and went around uh, two other websites posting uh, comments saying, 
horrible things about me and calling me a number of indecent names and actually uh, mm -hmm. not telling the truth about what had happened. She claimed that I had said her sister was a prostitute. I never said that, and to the best of my knowledge, her sister wasn't a prostitute. And I'm very sorry it ended up that way, but I wasn't mm -hmm. willing to remove the information. So, uh, so somebody disappears today, and then a year from now, it'll maybe end up on, say, I live here in Florida. It ends up, if Florida even has a database, I don't know. You'd know more about that than I was. But then that name ends up on that database, so at some point, you come to the Florida database. You see that a Jane Doe disappeared, and that's how you kind of put all this information into what I would call a friendlier – system to read and use yes i start out with you know jane doe's name on the database and then i go to old mr google and start looking for articles about the case mm -hmm. and sometimes i find nothing but sometimes i find quite a lot of information there is a very high profile case in hawaii practically a household name that a little boy named peter Kina. Mm -hmm. And his story is just absolutely horrific. He was supposed to be under the uh, – he was a ward of the De Department of Human Services. He was living with his parents, but the DHS was supposed to be watching him, and they didn't do a very good job. His parents were, last year, I think, finally charged with murdering him 20 years after the fact. 20 years. And, 20 years. Yeah. Oh, my. They never found his body, but – they have a lot of evidence. And anyway, when the Charlie Project was still fairly new, I remember because I was still in college at the time in my dormitory room, and the DHS in Hawaii got a new director who said, we want transparency here. We want everybody to know how badly we failed this little boy. Mm -hmm. And so they released his entire file to the public, normally confidential government documents. Mm -hmm. And it was all available in PDF form, downloadable on the internet, 3,000 pages. Oh my. And so in my dormitory room, I sort of stapled myself to a chair and read it all. Yes. And it was amazing. They had psychological evaluations done on the parents. They had details about the kid bouncing in and out of the foster care system, with the injuries that he had. He had a spiral fracture to his leg when he was a baby. And his parents said it was an accident, but spiral fractures basically aren't accidents. They can only be caused when the limb is twisted until it breaks. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote it all down. I wrote, I think, what was turned out to be about an 1,800-word essay about the background of this case taken from this DHS file. And the thing is, the DHS file, as far as I know, is no longer available on the Internet. So now the only place to find all of these details is on the Charlie Project. And I'm, I was very, very angry wow. about what had happened there. And I wanted everybody to know yeah. what had happened to this little boy and, you know, the horrible, miserable short life that he had led. And you say this was 20 years ago, but his parents were not charged until recently? Yeah. In fact, his disappearance wasn't noticed for months. Okay. So he disappeared like 1996, but it wasn't until like 2015 that they – they finally figured yeah. out how to charge his parents with his murder. Yeah. Wow. Of course, they didn't have the body, but the thing is, his siblings, they didn't see what happened, but they probably heard it. Yeah. There was evidence in that DHS file. His siblings were talking about it, and yeah. it's just it's just dreadful. And I, I feel like it's a duty of mine to tell the stories yeah. of, of what happened to these, these poor people. And you've got the more recent Erica Parsons case, and I, I think it's North Carolina, and she was missing for like 19 months before her brother reported it to the police. Do you get – I mean I know that when I hear something like that, I automatically – all these red flags start going up and saying, man, that's suspicious. Do you feel the same way? I often get you know, feelings about certain cases, mm -hmm. and unless – there is something in the press about it, like if the police are saying, you know, the parents are suspects or, you know, we have this evidence. I tend to keep my mouth shut because my feelings could be wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there have been instances where it looked like somebody was definitely guilty and it turned out they were innocent. I mean, 
for the longest time, everybody thought that that one guy, Richard Ritchie, had kidnapped Elizabeth Smart, and it turned out to be a completely different person. And poor Richard Ritchie died in the middle of this investigation under mm-hmm. suspicion with his name being dragged through the mud, and even I thought he'd done it. Mm-hmm. And it turned out it wasn't him. You know, seen... no, please continue, but I have, I have an interesting story for the listeners about our first conversation. Please continue. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Well, I've, I've seen... You know, other examples of that, that people will say things and, you know, not realize the impact of what they're saying. Like, uh, there was, in one case, the mother of a missing young girl was, like, in a supermarket and struck up a conversation with a stranger who didn't know who she was talking to. And, and the stranger brought up the missing girl and said, yeah, I think the mom did it because I saw her on TV and she wasn't crying nearly hard enough. And I read that, and I think, that's just disgusting. Yeah. I mean... Yeah. The listeners should know something. And, and, and See, I'm listening to you, Megan, and you, of course you are an encyclopedia. Not only do you run a website that's an encyclopedia of missing persons, but I know that up in your brain, you are also an encyclopedia because... Um, if you'll remember how we first talked to each other, that we had made an arrangement that I was going to talk to you on a Friday, and... I ended up getting caught up. I, I was uh, talking to a, a mother of a, a case that I was working on, and you had called me once, and I couldn't pick up. And then right after I got off the phone, you called me again, and I picked up the phone, and you introduced yourself. And I was like, oh, hello, sorry, I apologize. I was apologizing to you. And then I told you who I had been talking to you, and without hesitation, you told me, Oh, yeah, I know that case. That's so-and-so who disappeared in this year. And I hadn't even mentioned who disappeared. I just mentioned a family member. That was amazing to me. Well, that was amazing I'm, to me. It's it, it just so impressed. Yeah, I'm so... I, I memorize poems for fun. Yeah. Now, I, I'm, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a writer... And you write all of the bios on that site. So if people or the bios or the facts of how everything happened, you write all of that yourself, right? Yes, I do. Wow, that's a lot of writing. Do you have a writing background or is that just something that just said, you know what, I'm going to have to do this. I'm just going to have to start writing. Well, I, uh, I love writing, actually. Yeah. I, I write fiction from time to time. There's this novel I've been kicking around forever and it's not finished yet. And Mm -hmm. there is another website I write regularly for, which is about the death penalty and uh, the the death penalty throughout history in the world. The theme basically is on this day, uh, in this calendar day, in this year, so-and-so was executed and here is their story. Oh, my. And I found incredible uh, stories to write about on there and... And I am very interested in the Holocaust, I think, for some of the same reasons that missing people attract me, because it's a lot of people who just, you know, they, they're they gone. And I feel like I have to learn all of their stories and know who they were. Yeah. Because they didn't deserve what happened to them. No, they and did not. And I found not. a lot of very, very interesting uh, articles to write for Executor Today in my Holocaust reading. Mm-hmm. There was a really great one where a, where a guy, he was supposed to be turned over to the Nazis and uh, killed because he was involved in the resistance. And instead of doing that, the Jewish council in the ghetto made an identity card for him, and they smeared it with blood, and they took it to the Nazis, and they're like, oh, you must have caught him in a random shooting. Uh, yeah, we found this, this card in the pocket uh, of the pants on some totally mutilated, unrecognizable corpse in the cemetery, so you don't have to worry about him anymore. And they actually fell for it. Hmm. And I love that story. Yeah. And the, the fact, you know, the guy died in his bed in Israel at the age of 83. And I love coming up with stories like that so that other people, you know, who you don't think about yeah. still remember them after that. So this, so the Charlie Project, all, all, of course, it's helping us out here and, this is your way of making sure that these people are not forgotten, like so many people in the Holocaust have been. Yeah. That's and fascinating. Wow. Occasionally, occasionally people have been found as a direct result of 
of what I do on the Charlie Project. I know. I, I know that for a fact. I, I, I'm sure of that. There's no doubt in my mind. But I'm going to ask okay. you. I'm going to ask you something, and I, I this is maybe going to surprise a lot of people, being that I am I, I do a podcast, you know, Unfound for the true crime. You don't listen to any of these true crime podcasts, do you? You told me that you don't. Is that true? No, uh, for the most part, no. I it's a matter of efficiency. Yeah. You know, a podcast you, it'll be lasting for like half an hour or so, and yeah. you have to be paying attention to catch all the information. That's true. And <laughs> So you can't be doing anything else. And in the meantime, I could be, you know, scanning over a whole bunch of different articles and get a lot more information in that same amount of, of time. And usually because I already know so much about the cases to begin with, yeah. I'll learn maybe one or two small details from a podcast that I didn't already know. Right. Yeah, I, I, I can understand that. But being that you don't listen to them, are, are, you, are you cognizant or are you not cognizant of – the effect that your website has had on the genre as a whole are you are you are you aware of how much an effect it has had because i know it's a hu- i i'm going to tell you it's a huge effect are you aware of it i'll take your word for it i know <laughs> okay. a lot okay, of okay that's funny website you know mm-hmm. websites use my information so mm-hmm. i'll have i would assume that podcasts use it too yeah i don't have a problem with people using my information although i wish they would credit me for it. There are a lot of times when that doesn't happen and that upsets me. Yeah. There was a certain website who, I'm not going to name it. But, Please don't. Uh, they, <laughs> they were copying my cases just, you know, wholesale, the entire thing. Uh-huh. And on several occasions, I wrote to them saying, stop that, you know, just put, put a link to me at the bottom. That's all I asked. And they weren't doing that. And then I wrote to them again, finally, and I'm like, Look, okay, look at this information here on your website. It's the exact same details as on my website. And look, I, I, there's even the same typographical error there, okay? You guys copied this. I've asked you not to do that. And then in response, they went to that particular page on their site and changed the information, redacted some of it, and they went back to me and they're like, we don't know what you're talking about. Oh my. And I'm like, really? I have a screenshot here. And they finally stopped doing it. Um, I'm going to ask you this: you, you've you told me the Charlie Project just turned 12. Congratulations on that! And it, it's you know, and I've been interest, interested in disappearances and in, in, in missing person cases for many years as well. But the true crime genre, there's some other you know, there's some very popular podcasts and shows out there, and my show is fairly new. Have you ever been asked to do an interview for any of these other shows? Is this the first interview you've done on a True crime podcast, I guess you said. When was – have you ever been asked? Uh, no, never before. Wow. Was the first. That's interesting, too. I've been interviewed too. on TV and uh, radio shows and by many, you know, newspaper reporters, but I have never been on a podcast before. Well, I, I can't believe that I have a new show, and I'm actually the one who thought of it first. That's kind of weird to me, but wow. Okay. Um. You know, you have told me, and you kind of mentioned that with the, with the Hawaii case, and you've sent me, you know, you sent me some emails, you know, about a lot of the things. You, you really take an interest, to me it seems, in the disappearances of young children. It, would you say those are the ones that, that you take most an interest in personally or bother you the most? Well, for me it's not so much the age as the circumstances. What really bothers me is, like in the pure Peter Tima case where he wasn't reported missing for several months. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of cases out there where the person was not reported missing for some time, and it's it's an adult. It's kind of understandable because, you know, they have their own lives, and there could be legitimate reasons why they dropped off the grid for a while. But what really upsets me is when I see a case like Garnell Moore, for example. He wasn't missed for two years, and it wasn't even a matter of people really actively concealing his disappearance. There's just nobody realized he was missing, not even his own family. Mm -hmm. His parents had not really been a part of his life, and he appears to have been passed around to a series of more or less unwilling relatives. He was never enrolled in school. He was never in contact with any social service agency. It wasn't a matter of him falling through the cracks in the system because he was never in the system. 
and he dropped out of sight, and his extended family didn't notice it for a very long time, and I think it might have been a matter of them all thinking he was with somebody else. I'm not sure. And then they all got together and realized that he wasn't with any of them, and come to think of it, when was the last time they'd seen him? And this was a six-year-old child in the 21st century. That is a modern-day horror story. It is. And I this agree. little boy, he disappeared before he went missing, if you know what I mean. Mm. Nobody cared about Nobody him. Cared. Nobody, Nobody cared. even cared enough about him to, you know, know where he was. The kid never had a chance. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, and by the time the police found out, of course, two years had passed, and so it was stone cold from the very beginning, and they basically admitted in, in a news article about the case. So we had no idea what happened here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that, yeah. Th those, those ones uh, disturbed me as, as well. I'm going to ask you a question. If it's just a little too personal, uh, you just let me know, and I, I, I'll gladly just edit it out of the interview a bit. Okay. You know, when I go through your, you know, and I and I give you credit on my show. I even say I'll read off facts of a case, and it, what it usually ends up being is a condensed version of what you wrote. And I readily yeah. say that, but my show is not really caught up in a lot of the facts. I usually let the interview people who are close to the case talk about that. But I see so many cases where bipolar disorder is part of it. Does does that affect you in a certain way, being that you have suffered from that? D what do you think about that? You know, you, here you are, somebody who has struggled with it, you know, doing this, and then I know that you run into so, to so many, you write up so many articles and cases where it seems like that person was suffering from that as well. How does that affect you? Well, I... When I realized that I had, you know, a mental illness, and I, I had to go into the hospital for treatment multiple times, actually, mm -hmm. and I think maybe part of the reason I have always been an unusually cooperative patient is because I've seen so many horror stories of mentally ill people who stop taking their medications and just, you know, wander off into a void. Yeah. One of the people that was found as a direct result of my website, he, he was found dead. He was killed in a car accident a few days after he disappeared, but he had no ID. The reason that he disappeared in the first place was because he had bipolar disorder and he stopped taking his medication and had a, I guess, some kind of psychotic break. Yeah. And a lot of times people with mental illness, they'll get on medication and then, you know, their symptoms will improve and so they think, you know, I'm better, so I'll just stop taking this. And another common symptom with the more severe cases, particularly in schizophrenia, yeah. is the inability to recognize that you are sick. Yeah. And so, of course, they don't want to be taking medication for an illness they don't think they have, yeah. especially if it's causing side effects, which they usually do. I have side effects from my medications, and when I start a new a dose of, of medication, or if I have a, a, an increased dose for a while, I'm often completely unable to get anything done. My, mm -hmm. Until my body becomes used to it, I'll be, you know, my, my manual dexterity will be shot, I won't be able to type, I'll have a hard time even climbing up and down stairs. Mm -hmm. But I have always uh, done what my doctors have advised me to do. They told me, you know, you drink too much alcohol, you need to stop that, so I did immediately, and I've always taken my medicine, and it's a scary thing that even that often isn't enough, because the medicine will just abruptly stop working yeah. sometimes, and then you have to start all over again. So when you, when you also, write these, when you write these cases up, you know, and it says, well, this, this person had been suffering from bipolar disorder and hadn't been on their medication... You you can you more than anybody can identify with that. Not that you've been off your medication, but you know the circumstances of what might have been going through that person's head. Oh yes, and because of the nature of what I do, I have more than your average number of crazy people contacting me. <laughs> okay. For a while, I had a woman who was basically stalking me over the internet. She emailed me dozens of times a day, every day for months. Sometimes I could tell from the timestamps on her emails, she would just sit down at her computer and start emailing me and not stop for eight hours. Hmm. And yeah, that's weird. The emails were, it was obvious that she was 
not right in the head, and I actually did call the police about it. I wasn't worried about my personal safety, but the emails mentioned a certain address a lot, and I thought maybe she lives there, and I thought maybe if the police came to her house, they could get her some help, and nothing came of it. They did go to her house, but you can't force a person into treatment usually, and it's just just very sad, and I get occasional messages from very distressed people who think that that the voices are telling them to contact me because they have information that would help solve the case, for example, and I don't know what to tell those people because yeah. to begin with, even if they have legitimate information, I'm not the person to give it to. I just write these things. I don't try to solve them. Yeah. And there was one time when I actually did outright say to a person, look, there's no quite nice way to tell you this, but I think you're probably schizophrenic. You need to go see a doctor. And, of course, she got extremely angry with me for not taking her information seriously and said there was nothing wrong with her, and she refused to contact me again. Uh, what can you do? Yeah, what can you do? I want to ask you maybe a, a like a bigger picture question about uh, missing people and you know disappearances in the United States. Being that you've been doing this for 12 years, and, and you were right there on the front lines, do you think the United States is getting better at – um, solving these cases or accounting for them and helping these people who are high risk? Is, do you think it's getting better? Is it the same? Has it gotten worse? What do you think? Well, NamUs has been a really big help for solving cases, especially cold cases. I think they actually have some kind of computer algorithm that will automatically match missing people to unidentified bodies as you know, possible. Mm-hmm. And so NAMIS has been an enormous benefit. And as far as, you know, the chances of somebody actually getting getting abducted, yeah. the chances are actually quite low. Mm-hmm. In, like, Akon Pace, the little boy who disappeared from New York City in the 1970s, right. they, they actually did a, an experiment where they, they took the route that Akon had taken. He left his... his family's home to walk to the school bus stop. It was the very first day he was allowed to walk there alone, and he never made it to the bus stop. And they were trying to figure out, could this have happened today? I mean, him disappearing without a place like that. And they immediately discovered it would be impossible because the route took them past a whole bunch of businesses that all had closed-circuit television. So if a kid were to disappear on the streets of New York City, they would be be able to figure out what happened pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, yeah, 40 years later with the, you know, with the, you know, technology getting better and cameras getting smaller and smaller and they're cheaper and cheaper and, you know, people are going to start using them outside their businesses and everything. I, you know, that's going to make sense. In fact, a lot of people even have security cameras on on the outside of their houses and, and things these yeah. days. Would, would you say that in these 12 years, would you say that the state databases that you go to have gotten better, easier to use or improvements or what? Well, there are, are more state databases than there were 12 years ago, I can tell you that. Okay. And the Kelly Dorkowski, or Kelly Murphy now, actually, mm-hmm. who founded Project oh, Asian, she I know was Kelly. instrumental in getting the Nebraska state database going, and she, she's been a tremendous benefit. Any time the family of a missing person contacts me, I actually tell them you should go to Project Jason because yeah. they're really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I like Kelly and a lot. another thing that I I think is important is that as far as abductions go, we have become more aware of the possible dangers and the motivations behind kidnappings when it comes to, to children. There was a book I read about a, a missing child named Jeanette Tate who disappeared from the U.K. back in the 1970s. And mm-hmm. Jeanette was... She was 14 years old at the time of her disappearance, but in the photographs on the missing person flyers, they used a photo of her when she was 10 because she had just had her hair cut that way again just before she disappeared. And the book, which was written shortly after she went missing, she was never found, it said that the author, when he saw the, the photograph of her, he didn't understand why people were speculating that a sexual criminal could have been involved in kidnapping Jeanette because why would a sexual criminal t- kidnap a young child? Oh, my. And 
of course, nowadays, everybody knows that everybody that's knows. Dangerous. Everybody that's knows that now. A little bit too paranoid about it. My generation seems to have been the last one that was allowed to play outside on their own. Yeah. And you hear nowadays about families getting CBS called on them simply because they, were, they allow their children to play outside by themselves. Yeah. I even talked about that on my blog once. I, I once was at a online forum where parents were discussing, you know, stranger danger and everything and the freedoms they gave their children or intended to give their children. And one person said that he would not allow his child to even be in an elevator alone with uh, anybody outside the family because of the possibility that, you know, somebody else in that elevator could attack the child. And I'm thinking, this is, uh, you're kind of misguided here, okay? Do you honestly expect your kid to never be anywhere alone until he turns 18? Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think the overall, you're right, things have have gotten better but uh you know i know you you know we hear about helicopter parents these days and everything it can go too far the other direction as well can can definitely yeah. to, to go too far um let's let's wrap this up megan by uh just telling people obviously they know about charlieproject.org but you have a blog too what's the link to that and what do you just a little bit what do you do there on the blog well the uh the blog link is charlieross.wordpress.com. Okay. It's Charlie with the L E Y, just like the Charlie Project. Okay. And on the blog, basically, I, I have these regular features where I'll be like every Monday, I'll put up a themed list of you know missing persons cases. Like I don't know, sometimes I'll, one time I did like men who are, who disappear wearing silk because that's not a very common fabric for yeah. men's men's attire. And Usually not. Be, yeah, mm -hmm. totally random, and sometimes it, it, it will be, you know, a specific detail that could help people uh, track down unidentified bodies or, or something. Mm -hmm. It just depends on what I want. Yeah. And I'll be, I have, like, Flashback Friday where I do a case that uh, for a person who disappeared before I was born. Right. That's the right, only I've requirement. That. They have to have disappeared before the 5th of October, 1985. That was my date of birth. And I also write regularly sort of my opinions on cases because I don't put my opinions in the case files. I don't think it's, it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. But I do have opinions. And, yeah. you know, when I hear about cases like Peter Kuma's or the Adam Herman case in Kansas where he wasn't reported missing for 10 years and so i'll be writing about that and what i what i think about it mm -hmm. of and course i have regular contact with you know people who comment on my blog and they're mostly very nice folks i've yeah. not had to deal much in the way of polls and sometimes i'll be able to get in touch with you know family members of missing people uh using using my blog they'll like google the name of their family member and they'll find a blog entry i wrote about the case they'll put up a comment or two well that's nice i remember that's... once a man uh he decided to uh google the name of his ex-wife they had had a very short like less than a year marriage back in the 70s and he hadn't really heard from her since and he wondered what she was doing and maybe she was on facebook or something and to his shock and horror, he discovered that she had disappeared in the 80s and had probably been murdered by her second husband. Hmm. And, you know, he, he got in touch with me. And then, uh, so I wound up writing about that on the blog, about, you know, how this guy had just thought he was going to get in touch with his ex-wife on Facebook or something and find out that she's been missing all this time. And then someone posted a comment on my blog, was the missing woman's son. And then some anonymous individual posted a comment threatening the son, telling him that if he knew what was good for him, he would stop looking for his mother. And so then I had to call the police. Wow. That's... I hope that doesn't happen too much on your blog. No, no. <laughs> okay. that, I think that's the only time something like that has happened. Okay. You're on Twitter, too. How can people find you on Twitter? Uh, my uh, Twitter handle is Charlie's Missing. And every day I, ha I profile two cases, okay. just sort of randomly selected, one male, one female. And I have a Facebook page. The, both the Twitter account and the Facebook page were started by other people who eventually passed them on to me. Okay. All right, but you're, you, you run them now, though. 
Yes. Okay. And what's the what's the Facebook what's the Facebook page? Just Charlie Project. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, mostly I will just share recent missing persons news on there, not just American stuff, you know, the kind that I use, but also things thrown around the world. Like, for example, the in the refugee crisis in Europe, there are a lot of of migrants, especially children, who have disappeared, and no one knows if they've been trafficked or, or what, but it is a major problem. There are estimated to be over a 1,000 missing migrants in Great Britain, for example. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, Megan, I've uh, greatly enjoyed this conversation. I- I'm just to be honest with my listeners, I could talk to Megan all day. I, I just find just talking about cases and this stuff, uh, I just enjoy, I've enjoyed talking to her the first time we talked on the phone. And then the emails back and forth that we've had in the in the last few weeks, I, I have greatly enjoyed our con- our communication, and I hope that we can continue that, even if maybe you don't appear on the show again anytime soon. But I'd love to have you back sometime. Oh, I like talking to you too. Okay, uh, Megan. I like I like what you're doing. Oh, well, Megan, thank you so much. I love what you're doing. Okay. Well, thank you. Megan, thank you for joining me on Unfound. I enjoyed this interview. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, I appreciate it. You're welcome. And that was my interview with Megan Good from charlieproject.org. I know I've already said this in this show, but I'm going to say it again. I could talk to her all day. And it wouldn't even necessarily have to be about missing persons. In fact, we've had a couple discussions about cars and some other topics that have nothing to do with this show or with her her website. I just find her to be such an interesting person. I love her singularity of purpose, her focus on what she's doing. I love that. And people like that, if they are involved in the missing persons community, are always going to get a chance to tell their story on this show, always. Yes, this show is about covering cases Maybe a lot of cases that you haven't heard of. Maybe we can dredge something up, start getting uh, the police to start taking another look at some of these cases. But as I've told you, once in a while, I'm going to have somebody on this show like Megan Good. All right, I think I have a responsibility to do that. And she's out there doing quality work that I think greatly helps the rest of us, us out here doing these podcasts. Regarding her autism and bipolar disorder, I didn't bring it up when I introduced her because a couple reasons. One, I wanted you to get to know her the way I got to know her. Remember, I didn't know one thing about her, had never heard of her when I emailed the Charlie Project. As I told you before, I thought it was run by like 10 people or something like that. And I thought when Megan Good, quote-unquote Megan Good, got back to me, I thought she was one of many. She's just one of one. So there was that. And I didn't know anything about any anything about her life. That's how I wanted you to get to know her, first of all. Second of all, you'll notice how she even brings up her autism and Asperger's syndrome. She doesn't bring it up as some sort of weakness. She sees it as a strength. Go back and check it. Go back in this podcast. Go back to when she brings it up. She thinks it's actually an advantage for what she does. It's amazing to me. I just love that attitude. I love it. And I have to tell you, she makes me want to work harder. (laughs) I get six or seven cases that I'm looking at maybe going to her site some other locations, start researching information, start trying to get a hold of somebody that I can interview. He gets up to six or seven cases, and I start thinking, do I, do I really know what I'm doing here? Am I, make sure I don't mess up the facts and put this interview in the, in the wrong case. Here she has 9,500 cases, and she's just handling it like anything else. That's so inspiring to me. So I hope that she inspires you as well in whatever you do. you also notice that she brought up the statistic. I didn't bring it up. 75% of the people who have conditions like she has are unemployed. 
and here she is running one of the most popular missing persons websites in the world. I've checked the numbers. In the world, the, the amount of hits that her website gets dwarfs most of the other missing persons like podcast websites. I've looked it up. And here she is running that, whereas 75% of the other people who, who um, unfortunately suffer from the conditions that she has uh, are unemployed. Overcoming something like that, it's just amazing to me. And we are now friends on Facebook. We, Like I said, we mess each, o- each other back and forth. And I would love to have her on the show again somewhere down the road, maybe next year sometime. Maybe we can – See what's going on then. See what she's working on. Megan Good, thank you for the work you do. Thank you for being on this show, and I look forward to talking to you again. I'll leave the rest of the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel. And you've been listening to Unfound.